right, thanks Dr. Philpon. Thanks Smith and Nephew for allowing me to come and talk about microfracture. So before we start, we'll start with a case. This is a 20 year old football uh, collegiate player of mine who underwent a hip arthroscopy, a labral repair, and you can see when you compare the preoperative images above to the postoperative images below, you would expect with a very good correction that this patient should have pretty good outcomes. But intraoperatively, his acetabular side of the joint looked like this. So let's talk about the history of microfracture. It was developed and implemented in the earlier mid-1980s by uh, Dr. Stedman. He noted a need for a technique to treat full thickness chondral defects as they had a limited capacity to heal. Now, previous techniques at that time was mainly in the form of drilling and abrasion chondroplasty with moderate success. So if we talk about the core principles uh, that Stedman originally described, appropriate patient selection, meticulous surgical technique in addressing the related pathology, as well as evidence-based rehabilitation. So the technique that we know today involves creating a contained lesion by creating a shoulder or a stable rim of healthy cartilage following by creating channels in the subchondral bone that are perpendicular to the surface and using a pick rather than a drill to avoid thermal injury. And this will allow egress of pluripotent marrow-based progenitor cells and growth factors and leaving a, a rough raw surface that's critical to achieve for filling the defect and eventual clot adhesion. So a lot of the original work was done here in animal studies by uh, horses as, as similarly to we just saw, showing that uh, microfracture leads to increased volume as well as increased type two collagen. And when the cartilage, uh, calcified cartilage layer was removed, this also further improved the volume of the reparative tissue, but also improved the retention to the underlying structures. So if we look at the hip, femoral acetabular impingement has been proposed as the mechanism for labral and chondral pathology, and it's really the, tam the CAM type impingement morphology, which is an inclusion type mechanism that leads to not only the labral detachment, but also underlying chondral disease. And early studies have demonstrated a decline in hip arthroscopy outcomes when grade three and grade four chondral lesions are noted. So it's important to try to find a way to anticipate some of these chondral lesions and chondral disease. And out of WashU, Jeff Neppel, uh, upon a multivariate analysis, demonstrated that male gender, older age, advanced tonus grade, an elevated alpha angle, as well as insidious onset of pain was, highly, was uh, increased predictive of having a grade four chondral defect at the time of surgery. But how can we predict this preoperatively with the patients? Well, I think assessing your plain film radiographs, looking at asymmetric joint space or a joint space less than two millimeters, uh, the saber tooth sign, which um, Dr. Stubbs described as having a central acetabular osteophyte. But as we also talked about this morning with Dr. With Dr. Ho looking and analyzing the MRI, looking for any chondral thinning, bone marrow edema, bone marrow cystic formations, as well as perhaps some of the advanced MRI techniques such as degeneric and T2 mapping may help us in the future to try to predict which patients may have chondral disease at the time of surgery. So why hip microfracture? It's a single surgery, it's efficient and reproducible, and it also has good historical and literature support, not only in the knee, but now in the hip. So this was a first, uh, first originally described in 2006 by Dr. Philippon, and really the technique was adapted from the knee. But there's a lot of special considerations that you must think about when you deal with microfracture in the hip. Uh, as we know, a lot of these chondral defects occur right on the acetabular rim next to the labrum. So in order to keep a contained defect, we really should think hard about doing a labral repair or maybe even a labral reconstruction if the labrum is not repairable. Some of these uh, areas are more difficult to access and therefore need for some of the newer and different instrumentation to reach all the areas of the hip and then finally to address the contaminant pathology. So if we look back at Stedman's principles, looking at appropriate patient selection, I think really critically evaluating the uh, radiographs preoperatively, looking at AP as well as false profile radiographs for any joint space narrowing, not only superiorly in the weight bearing aspect, but maybe posterior inferiorly where we sometimes see inferior osteophytes, as well as looking at the MRIs as we previously discussed. And it may be important to discuss the possibility of microfracture with our patients before surgery because as we know, surgical findings can be unpredictable and the post-operative course is very different if a microfracture is performed. So meticulous surgical technique, it's important to stabilize the chondral margins, creating appropriate shoulders with some of the ring curettes as well as re 
uh, performing labor repairs or reconstructions, and carefully removing the calcified layer without going too deep with these ring curettes. And then finally, performing the microfracture by using athermomeral stimulation with the appropriate depth and spacing while trying to maintain the integrity of the subchondral plate. So here are some of the instruments that can be used and I encourage you to speak with your local reps about it as they may not be necessarily readily avail available. This is the large XL microfracture pick 90 degree. And in the center it really has this optimally positioned strike point that can help to deliver the force parallel to the, to the point of the microfracture all. As we know it can help to minimize any skiving and iatrogenic chondral damage if you try to hit this on the end of the, of the handle. So here's a 30-year-old male hockey player who underwent a microfracture. As you can see, we're removing the loose chondral stable flap with a biter and following this with a ring curette, not only to create stable margins of the adjacent cartilage, but also to remove the calcified layer. And it's important that you have a stable margin as this is is best for the outcomes. And with the microfracture all, you may not necessarily have to mallet this into place, but just simply wiggling it into the bone can be quite efficient in order to create these microfracture uh, holes. And then at the end, just verifying, shutting off your fluid and looking that the, the marrow elements are egressing. So as we mentioned, in, a, in, a, in, a, in addition to creating this microfracture technique, treating the underlying pathology, obtaining intraoperative fluoroscopic radiographs to demonstrate restoration of the femoral head neck offset, as well as earlier as we heard about by Dr. Ellis, dynamic assessment, butterfly test, as well as the internal rotation in 90 degrees of flexion to make sure that you've reduced the compressive and shear forces not only on the acetabular labrum, but the adjacent cartilage. And then finally, evidence-based rehabilitation, protected weight bearing, foot flat rate weight bearing, and early range of motion with a CPM for six to eight weeks is shown to be very beneficial amongst these patients with a structured functional rehabilitation and a gradual return to, to activities to pr protect the microfracture. So does this work? Uh, the first uh, review of, of patients who underwent microfracture by Dr. Philippon that underwent revision hip arthroscopy, nine patients, a mean average of uh, a mean of 20 months prior uh, underwent the microfracture, and they showed an overall fill rate of 91 percent. Slightly larger study, 20 patients. This is out of the UK, with an, an again a mean overall fill percentage of 93 percent. So we can see that we can 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 demonstrate good adequate fill of these locations. And this this study also looked at a biopsy of the location and demonstrated this to be primarily fibro cartilage, but there was some expression of type 2 collagen. So here's just a, a patient, a 35-year-old, who underwent a prior microfracture and labral repair, demonstrating the area of the prior microfracture and very good near 100% fill, as well as full healing of the labrum. So what do the outcomes show us? There's been an abundance of level 2, 3, and 4 evidence since 2008, and a very good systematic review by FEMI of 12 studies, 267 patients, showing good short to medium-term outcomes with a 78% return to sport and a very low complication rate. And only three patients out of 267, so 1% of patients underwent joint arthroplasty at a mean of 30 months. What can we tell our athletes? Thanks to Dr. Philippon's studies, uh, we have a very high return rate to play. Uh, this is a 39 elite male athlete, 77% return to play at a mean of three years follow-up, which was not significant to patients who did not undergo microfracture, 84%. And specifically looking at professional ice hockey players, again, 82% return to play. So in conclusion, microfracture is a minimally invasive, low morbidity, cost-effective, and reproducible technique. There's a growing body of clinical literature. And it's important to follow Stedman's original principles of patient selection, surgical technique, and rehabilitation. And at the end of the case, I encourage you to look at the egress of marrow elements. Thank you.